Coming up from Oshkosh, a huge win for the future of general aviation, the growing role of simulators. And dare we call it a Frankenplane? And a newbie soars with the birds for the first time. AOPA Live this week begins in just a moment. Celebrate 20 years with Sonic's aircraft by building and flying your dream. Quick handling, fun, and capable kit aircraft models to suit your flying passions. Get the best performance per dollar with Sonic's aircraft. This is AOPA Live This Week with Tom Haynes and Melissa Rudinger. Welcome to day two of our air venture coverage. You know it wouldn't be Oshkosh without a bit of weather excitement. Uh, the Wednesday night air show had barely started before the thunderstorms rolled in. The grounds and the campers were pretty soggy the next morning, but that didn't dampen any spirits. And our spirits are through the roof, thanks to you. It's a really big deal, I'll tell you that. I am so darn proud of the general aviation community, AOPA members, and our staff to pull together and raise $3.6 million uh, and get it pledged to help youth continue aviation. I'll tell you what, makes me very proud. Very, very proud. At a breakfast for AOPA Foundation donors here at Oshkosh, Mark announced that you have met the challenge. Actually, more than met the challenge. You may recall that the Ray Foundation challenged AOPA members to donate $1.4 million in 180 days. The Ray Foundation would match it if the challenge were met. Some 3,800 of you pulled out your wallets. The original um, challenge was for 1.4. You exceeded it by getting to 1.8 in contributions as of last night. Went back to the Ray Foundation and their board, and they generously upped and matched that again to 1.8. And this money goes to making general aviation stronger. It's a huge kick for our You Can Fly programs to get more people flying and help for the AOPA Air Safety Institute. And this is something that was very important to the late James Ray. Well, I think we're continuing a legacy of philanthropy from a great American. Uh, James flew B-17s in World War II um, and went on after the war to fly th right up into his mid-80s. Um, he credits aviation and uh, flight training provided courtesy of the U.S. Army Air Corps in 1942 with equipping him with life skills, uh, not just flying skills. You know, you have to set your course and fly the, fly the program. Uh, you have to assume responsibility for your own actions. You have to be disciplined. And all those life skills that he were formed in flight training is really uh, what he's trying to encourage our youth of today to learn through aviation. So a natural counterparty for our foundation's mission of youth and aviation is AOPA, which does such a wonderful job of that. So at the end of the day, what we're talking about, $3.6 million between the Ray Foundation and AOPA donors is phenomenal. That's the largest fundraising effort that AOPA has ever had. It's phenomenal in 180 days. That, that, that's remarkable. So thank you everybody for the support, for particularly for the You Can Fly initiative, which is really critical to helping us uh, turn around the pilot population situation and keep uh, pilots who are active, uh, more active, get them involved in flying clubs and all that sort of thing, and the high school initiative. So lots going on with the You Can Fly, so check it out online. And here at the You Can Fly Pavilion, there's a new way for aviation of all ages to make their mark on flying with a new banner. The canvas provides a place to share words of wisdom, lessons learned, write about an aviation dream, or just sign your name. What were you doing when you were 18? If you're like me, you were flying, but around the world? Not your average kid. Australian Lockie Smart went flying solo around the world at 18. He's here at the show sharing his story. I, I'd always had this sort of um, this idea in my mind that I wanted to show other young people that we don't have to accept the connotations that we're given about being young, that we're lazy and incapable and unmotivated. I wanted to show you what you could really do and I had no money, no flight experience, no way that I was going to be able to do this trip theoretically and it was only through a lot of, a lot of hard work, perseverance and determination that over two and a half years I was able to plan and fundraise nearly half a million Australian dollars to get the trip just to a point where we could start and then over the next 54 days face some incredible challenges and amazing moments to successfully make it back and be the youngest person to fly solo around the world. This is Lockie's first visit to Oshkosh and he is impressed by the scope and scale of the event, quite unlike anything he's seen in Australia. He's staying in the United States for the next couple of years, sharing his inspiring story to corporations and helping them understand how to engage and communicate with millennials. See more from him at his website at luckysmart.com. 
And speaking of big dreams, we caught up with Rachel St. Louis again. We've followed Rachel's story over the past couple of years here at Air Venture. She's a 16-year-old building her own Kit Fox airplane. She's paying for the project by selling aviation-themed jewelry. I decided to get this because I just love flying so much and I decided that I wanted to get a plane and if it's gonna be my plane, I wanna make sure I build it and I know every little piece of it. Since last year, Rachel has finished most of the fuselage of the airplane. Now she's earning the money to buy the engines and avionics. If you're here at Oshkosh and want to help Rachel reach her goal, stop by and take a look at her jewelry at the Fly Mall or you can look at it online. Encouraging the next generation of young people to pursue careers in aviation is one of the top priorities of our industry. AOPA is right at the front of that effort, training teachers and funding STEM curriculum, which uses aviation principles and blends ever-improving tools like Redbird flight simulators into the programs. As Paul Moses discovered, many young people are spending at least part of their time not on the flight line, but in the classroom. They are quickly becoming essential tools of the teaching trade. Simulators like those here in the Redbird STEM lab, where free courses for young students bring theory and aeronautical principles to life. Now then, we're actually using the airplane for something other than just something that's just like the really the coolest thing ever, right? For sisters Aaron and Alyssa Carpenter, it's an opportunity to exercise more than their minds. It engages their senses. These simulators provide immediate and dynamic impact on how things like speed and weight and temperature impact things like lift and engine performance. All week long, they can come in and take everything from intro to flight to advanced flight planning and, and aviation weather. And it's all tailored around the idea that we can use aviation to introduce STEM topics and get kids involved in the more technical disciplines and aviation is a great tool to do that. Last year I crashed and burned a lot. I didn't crash and burn though and I was proud of myself. And you don't have to look far to see a great number of young people who love the challenge. It's a relatively low cost way to set fire to the dream of flight. So much more fun. Is it? Why do you say that? Because usually like say you're at a school and you, you learn this, all you're doing is papers, you're not learning like on a simulator like here. And no doubt what works here can and will work elsewhere. It's a great experience to see kids really get it when they work through the math or work through the problem that they're working on and go out and fly it in the sim and they actually get it, it's a, it's a great experience for sure. Paul Moses, AOPA Live. Redbird also provides assistance for teachers looking for help writing grants to fund the equipment needed for these interactive programs. And Redbird is showing off a model of its Six Degrees of Freedom motion platform. The system has spider-like arms connected to fittings that move up and down by jack screws. Balance weights cancel out the weight of the sim cockpit, making it easy to move, start and stop quickly. It's entirely electromechanical, no hydraulics. And no word yet on when it may be available, but it's expected to cost less than the company's VTO helicopter simulator, which retails for about $150,000. More good news on the affordable avionics front. Garmin announced that their retrofit autopilots will soon be available for more aircraft. The GFC 500, designed for lighter aircraft, will soon be approved for some Bonanza models, Cessna 210s, and the Grumman AA5. The GFC 600 for larger airplanes will soon be approved for installations in Barron's and Cessna 208B models. Garmin's retrofit autopilots are more affordable than traditional units and provide a range of important safety features. TrueTrack is another company with a popular autopilot retrofit. At the show, the company announced that the autopilot will be approved for installation in Moonies. The true track costs around $5,000 before installation. Currently, the autopilot is approved for the Piper PA-28 and 32, and the Cessna 172, 175, and the 177. And Cessna's here showing off a full cabin mock-up of the new Denali. The Denali is a single-engine turboprop design with six seats. The display here shows off the large cargo door. The airplane will be powered by the new GE Catalyst engine. First flight is expected next year. Speaking of jet-powered aircraft, there's one here that doesn't fit any mold, but it sure is fun to watch. Uh, AOPA Live's Josh Cochran has the story about the Yak-110 flying in the air show at AirVenture for the first time. Two average airplanes equal one extraordinary airplane. 
At least that's what airshow performer Jeff Bourbon was hoping for when he conceived the Yak-110. The Yak-110 is made up of two Yak-55s put together. They're two airplanes that otherwise wouldn't be all that interesting, but we've put them together, we've added a jet engine to that, and now we're in a position to uh, share my passion for aviation and, and spread that to you know the hundreds of thousands of people that'll be here this week. The jet engine makes the Yak-110 especially fun to watch and fly. You take CJ-610, put a um, 3,000 pound jet engine on there, and I call it the fun lever. We have more fun, less fun. More fun, and that, that's really the, the best way to describe the airplane. It's just so easy to fly, just like the Yak-55. Um, and then you add 3,000 pounds of additional thrust. It really is an amazing airplane. With the uh, differential power, we you know, three different throttle levers so we can pull the left side back to yaw it and kind of spin around or vice versa on the right side. So a lot of really cool potential. We've only just started to scratch the surface on what the Yak-110 is really going to bring to the air show uh, world as far as you know, new and inventive aerobatic. Although the Yak-110 in many ways flies like a 55, the pilot's position away from the center line takes some getting used to. One of the interesting things really is when you when you roll to the right, it wasn't that significant from like a, a feeling uh, of the g-force and stuff, but when you roll to the left, you have negative g-force pulling you out of the seat, which is really kind of strange. And everything about the Yak-110 is kind of strange, but that's part of the appeal. And so far this week, the audience loves it. I think that the, the initial reaction is, you know, we thought that was photoshopped to begin with. Then we thought, okay, well, this is just two airplanes that we put together. It's gonna make a couple passes around and it might be interesting. But when it actually flies, it's the real deal. It's a fully uh, aerobatic airplane. And I think that's the thing that catches most people by surprise. Josh Cochran, AOPA Live. I saw it fly yesterday. I, I thought it was a real tight formation. <laughs> I had the same reaction. It is definitely a head turner. Really unusual airplane. Never seen anything quite like that. Coming up after the break, it's a family affair. And a newbie straps a fan to his rear for the first time. You always knew it was your perfect airplane. Now it can have the perfect panel. Garmin G500 TXI and Garmin G600 TXI, the next generation of flight displays. Welcome back to Oshkosh and AirVenture 2018. Lots of folks make the trip to Oshkosh annually. In fact, if you look around, you can find families with several generations represented. As Jennifer Nahn tells us, it's a tradition that they find fulfilling in many different ways. Sam Scaletta is doing all he can to pass along his love of aviation. Wandering the warbirds with his son Michael and grandson Jackson, he proudly shares a passion passed down by his father-in-law who flew in World War II. It's always fun. Uh, we really like the warbirds, the classics, and then also it's always fun to find what's new and innovative. I really enjoy the warbirds and the classics. There's nothing like the, uh, the AT-6, the P-51s, the Corsairs, the Bearcats, the Tiger Cats. All of those classic war, World War II fighters, uh, the, pist the large piston engine fighters is what really got me excited and still does to this day. And Generation 3, Jackson, he's only 12, but already has his eyes to the sky. I do Civil Air Patrol at our aunt, local Anderson Squadron where we'll go in and they'll teach us about airplanes and they have a 182 that they fly and then we'll get to learn like drill and we get to wear Air Force ABU uniform so it's a lot of fun. Be it camping under a wing or at the local Holiday Inn, year after year they come. The Nordbys have been coming here together for 35 years. We found them camping by their Dakota. Now it's a fine family tradition. We started coming before he bought his first airplane and I knew that it was something important to him. And so we started coming and I kind of got hooked on just the airplanes themselves. You, you talk to pilots and you get information uh, and, and you find out what they enjoy doing. And, and, uh, and I think that's, it gets to be more about talking to people and, uh, and, and your camping mates here uh, yeah. on the grounds. And uh, yeah. it almost gets to be that's what it's almost about, more the pilots more than the planes after a while. The Nordby's daughter Jennifer has been coming to Oshkosh her entire life. Can she imagine her life without making the annual pilgrimage? No, definitely not, since it's a big part of my life. Um, and this whole trip, again, this is like the one trip we take every single year of our yeah. lives. So 
So when you're married and have grandbabies, are they coming to Oshkosh? Definitely, yes, definitely. I'm hoping to get my pilot's license and then be able to take my family here. That will make three generations for the Nordbys as well, although it will likely have to wait until after medical school. Jennifer Nahn, AOPA Live. Well, we like to focus on the fun of flying. It goes without saying that there's a serious side too. A safety issue that is top priority for the National Transportation Safety Board is a loss of control in general aviation accidents. Here at Oshkosh, the NTSB held a multi-hour forum with a group of experts to explore the issue. Included was our own Richard McSpadden, who heads the AOPA Air Safety Institute. Famed airshow pilot Patty Wagstaff advocated for more training near the edges, edges of the performance envelope. We don't need more regulations to do the right thing, just like we don't need somebody to regulate us brushing our teeth, but we do it. We don't need a lot of acronyms. We don't need a degree in theoretical physics. We can fix it, and I don't think it's that hard. Aerobatic training or upset training really is your choice. It's just the right thing to do. Of course, there's a wealth of resources on the Air Safety Institute website that can help you become a safer pilot. And a lot of the material has now been optimized to watch on your iPad. AirVenture is always a technology showcase. Among the maturing products we've seen before is the My Go Flight Sky Display head-up display. The, present, the presentation has matured considerably since we saw it in a simulator last year. This year it's mounted in a Cirrus. CEO Charlie Schneider says certification is just weeks away. It's useful in all phases of flight to make your, your flying more comfortable, safer, more precise, and more enjoyable. Like other head-up displays, it's meant to keep your eyes outside. The system automatically declutters the display depending on phase of flight ultimately leading the pilot through the flight with all the essential information projected at affinity ahead of him. So we've completed our first round of flight testing with the FAA. We've been told that this will be something that they'd like to see certified. So uh, we're very uh, happy about that. And so we hope to conclude this process sometime in early fall. The unit weighs about 2.5 pounds, costs about $25,000. It'll be available under an approved model list for dozens of models. So what's going to replace 100 low lead AV gas? There's a new competitor in the race. Phillips 66 was a bit late getting to the party, but here at AirVenture they say they've teamed with Afton to formulate a fuel that they think is the next best thing. The final piece to it is where Afton comes in, and that's the additive portion of it. Now I'll tell you, these components that I just described to you, if I was describing 100 low lead, it would be essentially the same thing. Uh, so you take out the 100 low lead has an additive pack called TELB. You take out that additive pack, which contains lead, which is giving your octane boost, and you bring in a manganese-based octane booster. The reason we did this is to keep the components as similar to 100 low lead as possible. The reason that's important is we don't want you to have to change, ideally, going back to the vision, anything on the aircraft. So you would do what we call a drop-in, switch from the fuel you're using today and you drop in the new fuel and you go and there's no changes to the aircraft. So this is a highly competitive race and all the other hopefuls were in the audience to check out what Phillips had to offer. AOPA is part of the Piston Aviation Fuels Initiative or PAFI which is writing the roadmap for a, re a replacement fuel. So PAFI was established obviously to find a a fuel that would be unleaded to replace Hunter low lead for the entire general aviation fleet. That is a very difficult process. Clearly, you know, when you take a fuel that is developed and been in use for, you know, 50 plus years, and then take that and replace it with an unleaded fuel, technologically, it's, it's a very difficult task. So PAFI was established to take a bunch of applicants in, evaluate those candidate fuels, and then whittle it down to the best possible candidates, and then go forward from there. And then ultimately, once we get through that process, authorize essentially the entire fleet for one or both of those unleaded aviation fuels. There is no picking of a winner. Is we're gonna make it through the process and if one or both of those fuels make it through that process and, and is proven to be a safe replacement for 100 low lead, then both will be authorized to, to replace it and essentially be certified for use. Now what goes on from there is we move into transition period and then obviously the marketplace will select what possibly would be the best candidate fuel. The ultimate goal is a replacement fuel that is affordable and will work without modifications to the existing fleet. And finally, there's a new excitement here about the lighter side of aviation. The grass strip here at Oshkosh is busy with dozens of pilots flying paramotors. 
AOP Live executive producer Warren Morningstar has a story about what it's like to fly a paramotor. Okay, normally when there's flying to be done, I'm going to do it myself. But this time, I decided I'd send the new guy first. So about five miles from Air Venture, the camera crew caught up with the members of the Paradigm Aerobatic team to experience a different kind of aviation. Obviously, been on commercial airlines, been on uh, private planes. My father is a helicopter pilot, so I have been in helicopter many times, but I've never been on a hang glider, never done the parasailing thing that everyone does when they go to the beach, never anything like that before. I'm about to go on a, in a big fan, <laughs> strapped to a dude's hey, back. Hey, at least it ain't strapped to, to your butt. <laughs> We're classified as ultralight aircraft under the FAA, so there is no license required, no medical, no age requirement. Basically, as long as we are out of controlled airspace and away from congested areas flying over people, so usually we fly in G in the airspace, we can pretty much do whatever we want, up to 18,000 feet. I'm gonna just keep running, and I'm gonna run. There are schools across the country that offer 10-day courses to take a student from beginner to solo. I call the paramotor the ultimate all-terrain vehicle because you can go fly around a field and then jump over the trees and go to the next field. And it's the coolest feeling in the entire world. It really is. So when you think about true flying like birds, paramotoring is about the closest you can be to that. Almost the most natural form of flying you can have as a human being is this form. And it's just incredible. Like, I want everyone to do this so they can experience what I did. Right now, the sport is a lot smaller in the US than I think it should be. There are small European countries with more pilots than we have in the whole United States. Most people have no idea what a paramotor is or how they work or how you fly or much less how you take off with them. So I would love to see the sport grow here in the U.S. Fun, exhilarating, thrilling. There's so many more one-word answers I could give of what I felt as I went up there. And the best part is that operating costs are under $10 per hour. Good job. Yeah, man. Thank you. It was such an incredible time and uh, got my helmet and uh, hopefully I can go back again sometime soon. Okay, so maybe next time I'll try. Warren Morningstar, AOPA Live. Wow, that is some kind of flying, I gotta say. Way to go, Spence, trying that out. Yeah, I guess the keep running is the equivalent of no matter what happens, keep flying the airplane. I guess so. <laughs> Always maintain control. <laughs> and that does it for this show. But remember, we'll be back again on Saturday for another special edition of AOPA Live this week. See you all tomorrow. the pilots who fly with AOPA Insurance. They love flying and saving money, just like you. At AOPA Insurance, we understand how you fly and provide the coverage you need to keep on flying. Call for a free quote and see which AOPA Insurance plan is right for you.